Welcome to Parenting Successful Teens, the podcast that cuts through the overwhelm and stress of this phase and offers parents simple, practical, cognitive, science-based strategies for keeping their teens on track. Join master coach and real-life mom, Allie Irwin, to talk about real teens, real problems, and the skills it takes to raise successful adults. Hello, everyone. This week, we're going to do something different because... I have been getting a whole bunch of messages from people who are freaking out about something. And I say that with so much compassion because at this point, like freaking out, (laughs) given everything we've been through the last couple of years and our constant like low level state of fear for our families, for our jobs, for our own health, for you know, just all the things, we are more sensitive to freaking out than we would have been, you know, without a pandemic going on. And so even though, you know, it feels like the worst of that is behind us, it's left our systems with like a heightened response to stress. So I thought I would share this week seven of my favorite ways to manage a freak out. I've got a couple that help you manage your mind, you know, those ruminating thoughts when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're afraid. I've got some that help like your physical self, help you calm your physical self down because freakouts have both aspects. We have a physical response and then we think thoughts to explain that physical response, that heightened heart rate. Um, And then it goes the other way as well. Like we have thoughts that create a physical response. You can come in from either angle or both. And then um, the third option is reducing your environmental stressors. Okay, so we're going um, brain ways, body ways, and environment ways. And definitely you can combine these, use as many as you need until you are calm. And if you are not finding calm, I really encourage you to reach out. I do free discovery sessions where we talk about what's going on in your life. And, you know, I can help you get a different view, you know, an outside perspective helps us see our own situations more clearly. And on those calls, we can talk about how to work together or, You know, if working together is not something that you're interested in, people still walk away from those sessions really feeling like that was time well spent, feeling better, and feeling like they have a clearer understanding of what's happening for them. So if you try these seven tips and you can't uh, seem to get any relief, I really encourage you to reach out and book one of those free sessions at Allie at AllieIrwin.com. That's my email. You can send me an email and ask for one. Or I think there's spots on my website. Uh, Maybe there's a work with me tab. I actually don't know. Um, You know, that will take you right to my scheduler and you can pick a time. Okay, here we go. Here is your freak out toolkit. We're going to start with the mental things that you can do. The things to help calm those ruminating like runaway thought trains in your head. The first one is to offer yourself different perspectives. So I want you to think about the situation that's stressing you out and think about what different people would would tell you. Like if you could have a sit down with uh, Oprah, what would Oprah say? You explain the situation to Oprah. What is Oprah's perspective of that situation? What is Mr. Rogers perspective of that situation? What would he tell you to do in that situation? What would your personal role models um, take on that situation be? And that will obviously change based on the situation. Like if it's a financial situation, I'm going to have a different role model than if it's a you know, dating situation with one of my kids. So conjure up sort of a role model in that area and imagine having a conversation with that person. Uh, What would your neighbor say? What would um, 
a younger version of yourself, like if say your child is 20, what would your 20 year old self be advocating for in this situation? And conversely, what would an older version of yourself, you know, what would if you um, have a great relationship with your grandmother, like what would your grandmother say about this situation or an older version of yourself? What do you think you would say 20 years from now about this thing that's stressing you out? Okay, so just my encouragement is to play, don't just pick one, but pick a couple of different, this can be a great journaling exercise Or uh, conversely, if you are alone in the car, you can just have this conversation with yourself. You know, you can just imagine out loud what these people would say. And the, the way to do that is when the reason to do that is because when you're in those situations, our perspectives, like our field of vision narrows and narrows and narrows on a single worrying thought often. And what you want to do is you want to expand that back out and see your the thing that you're freaking out about from a bunch of different perspectives. And you can take it. I mean, like, let one of those people be RuPaul or someone who you vehemently disagree with and, like, say what they would be advocating in the situation because the idea is just to really broaden your perspective of what's happening and challenge your your own ideas that you know exactly what's right to do and there's, like, only one right way to think about this and why can't you get your kid to think about it the same one right way you are? You know, you're trying to expand that out so that you can kind of loosen. It's like a log jam in your brain. It's like a log jam of worry. And we're trying to loosen it up so that it can and flush out and not keep cycling. Okay, because that will help your freak out and it will help whatever decision um, you need to make about this situation. Okay, so that's number one. That's kind of long. I'll try to speed these up a little bit. Number two is is to find the kernel of truth in the worry and find out what your fear is trying to tell you. Very often when you're freaking out, there's both um, like kind of nonsense and noise and a kernel of truth. Oftentimes in a freak out, both of those things are happening. And if you are feeling calm enough that you can start to tease out what is the kernel of truth in amongst all of this noise, very often your freak out is actually trying to give you a helpful message. And that helpful message is contained within the kernel of truth. Maybe there is one thing that you need to do or you need to be aware of, more information that you need to have. And if you can find out what that fear is trying to tell you and answer that, then the other things will calm down. Okay, so in this instance, we're not pushing the freak out away. We're actually kind of walking towards it with the confidence that there's something useful there for us. Okay, you might not be able to do that until you employ one of the other methods, especially perhaps one of the physical methods of calming down. But when you get to the place where you feel calm enough to look for the kernel of truth, I promise there is value there. Again, this is one of those places where an outside perspective, whether it's me or if you have a trusted confidant that's not going to join you in the freak out, they can listen to you and tease out what they're hearing and oftentimes help you find that kernel of truth. Okay. Number three is to offer yourself a compassionate mantra, okay? In amongst all the repetitive ruminating thoughts, if you can toss in a compassionate mantra like, of course you're worried about this. It's perfectly normal to worry about this. You're so worried about it because you love your kids and you don't want anything to happen to them. Having compassion for yourself in your freak out will help you kind of holding yourself like the scared, you know, the part of yourself that's like a scared child. What you're doing with those compassionate phrases is you're holding yourself with compassion while you're freaking out and that will help you feel more calm. Okay, next we're going to move to my 
uh, let's see, one, two, three physical things. So three mental things, three physical things, one environmental thing. Okay, the first physical thing is I've talked about before on the podcast. It's the idea of halt, hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. That's from um, addiction research shows that people are most vulnerable to relapses when they're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And they're saying if you're one of those things, like if you're feeling the urge to use, check in and see if you're feeling one of those things and address one of those things, and that will help you reduce your urge to use. And I think this this research is really valuable for worry as well, because worry in a way becomes a, like a mental addiction that we have. And so if you parse those out, two of those are physical, hungry and tired. And those physical symptoms can be any physical symptom. You could be hungry, you could be thirsty, you could be tired, you could be in physical pain. So that acronym HALT, hungry, angry, hungry, angry lonely, and tired, really can stand for a bus- a bigger range of things. So two physical things, hungry and tired, can be all the different physical things. And then angry and lonely, um, it could be sad or scared. You know, it could be you're more vulnerable to worry when you're sad. You're more vulnerable to worry when you're lonely, you know, you're more vulnerable to be freaking out when you've got other unaddressed, unfelt emotions happening. And even just being aware, (laughs) sometimes if I'm freaking out, I'm like, oh, I just need to go to bed. Like I know that sleep feels and I have like a whole sleep protocol of things that I do to help me fall asleep. But I know that when I'm worrying about something at night, like that worry is not helpful to me. And knowing that I can just go to bed and things will look different. I don't need to make any decisions. Things will look different in the morning. Like that grandmotherly piece of advice really holds true. Sometimes I just need to eat. Sometimes I just need to um, veg out with, you know, something that makes me laugh, like listening to a couple of minutes of a comedy special, which is all over Spotify and YouTube so easy to plug into, you know, pictures of puppies or comedians or whatever helps you shift your mood. Those things matter. Okay, so I kind of already hit uh, the second physical thing is to do things for yourself that are physically comforting. For some people, that's a hot cup of tea or a latte or a cookie or to wrap up in a favorite blanket or for me I find it hugely physically comforting to go for a walk outside Um, anything outdoors physically comforts me motion outdoors especially Um, sometimes when I'm really freaking up I'll wrap up really tightly in a blanket it's almost like I'm you know you know how you burrito roll babies in a blanket I almost do that to myself I find that physically comforting sometimes that's actually part of what's happening in a hug, right, is that physical compression. And a hug is another really great example because then you also have the oxytocin of that connection with another person. So if you have someone in your life that could give you a hug, asking for a hug is physically comforting. That will help you calm your freak out down. Okay. So those that's two. The third thing I have also talked about on this podcast before, which is humming. Just putting on some music and humming while you're doing things sends a signal to your nervous system that you're okay. Okay, we don't hum when we're running from a predator. (laughs) We don't stop and sing them a tune. But so it tells, so when we're humming, it's telling our nervous system that we're okay. And it actually, there's all kinds of scientific research. There have been whole books written about the practice of humming and how it lowers your blood pressure and sends endorphins and happy neurotransmitters through your system to tell you that you're okay. So just humming, you can hum your favorite song. You don't have to know the words. You can sing your favorite song. Car karaoke, again, um, if you can just sing or hum, that will help calm your freak out. 
So that was three mental, three physical, and then the seventh tip is to reduce environmental exposure to things that make you anxious, okay? To just literally not check Twitter, turn off the news that's running in the background. Um, Whatever things freak you out, if you have physical reminders in your house, like, you know, if it's a bill that you're freaking out about, maybe don't have it on the kitchen counter, put it in a place where you are able to address it. I'm not saying to (laughs) put it in a drawer. This isn't a TV show. I'm not saying hide all your bills in a drawer and like pretend they don't exist. But maybe you don't have to look at it a hundred times a day. Maybe it doesn't have to sit on your kitchen counter. Maybe there's a way to put your child's report card. I know that those don't come in physical form anymore, but maybe turn off power school notifications so that make a time to address it but don't have it in a place where it's just poking at you all day long. Put away those physical reminders and turn off any notifications that stress you out. Okay? We don't, when you're freaking out, we don't need to add more things to the pile. It doesn't make you a better human to be informed about things that you can't contribute to anyway. It doesn't make you a better human to keep exposing yourself to things that freak you out. So let me know which tip you tried. Let me know if it was helpful. Let me know if I left any of your favorite ways to calm a freak out down. Like send me an email and let me know what you do that helps. And I'll do another one of these podcasts and offer seven more tips. There's Having a huge toolkit of ways to help yourself feel calm and safe makes you, like freaking out doesn't make you an amazing parent. It's like something that happens to us parents that is unavoidable. It's just part of parenting. But not staying in the freak out, getting back to our home base of calm, that's where we make all of our great parenting decisions. And when we are an oasis of calm, the people in our lives feel safer to tell us the real things. And then we have more information to work with. So there are lots and lots of benefits of really tending to your own nervous system and helping yourself feel calm. So like I said, shoot me an email, ali at aliirwin.com, and I will see you next week. Hey, if you enjoyed today's show and you want even more support and a shot of fresh inspiration in your email box each week, you have to get on my list. Sign up to receive my free guide on how to stop second guessing yourself as a mom. There are so many decisions to make as a mom, and this guide will help you to make decisions and just move on. No more waking up (laughs) 3 a.m. wondering if you made the wrong decision. This guide is so good. Even my non-mom clients are raving about it. So sign up today, and I will see you next week.